people are genuinely um, worried about the stigma and what it would mean practically. So, for example, let's say, okay, I feel a fever coming on. What do I do? I know my, that my main hospital is not working very well. So what do I do? I either present myself to an Ebola isolation unit where I think, okay, here yeah, I might have a chance to be infected, but also I may be stigmatized. So if I come back home and my landlord hears that I've been at, to an Ebola center, he then gives me notice. He says, <laughs> and I don't blame the landlord either, and I don't blame the person, but the landlord also is looking after other tenants, he's looking after his livelihood as well. What does he do? Your, your, you know, your boss hears that you've, you, you, you possibly could be infected with Ebola. If you're lucky, he stops you from coming to work for 21 days. But sooner or later, probably, you know, if you're, let's say, if you're a house boy or you're um, a, a portal cleaner, what are the chances that people are going to keep paying you for a long time? The chances that you lose your job. So people have all of these things to keep, to keep thinking about. I understood through um, the women lawyers group um, pro you know, legal, that provides legal services, that they had a lot of initial inquiries and complaints from health workers and from nurses about um, stigma and discrimination in the communities. That um, we heard stories about families of deceased nurses being given notice to quit and being asked to leave, the landlord suddenly wanted the, the property. There, there is a lot of stigma. And, um, you know, I'm not blaming the people who are stigmatizing either because what it is is that everybody's fear, fearing. It, it, stigma is coming out of fear. So this person has Ebola, what does that mean for you? It means that you associate them with, with them, you, you, you most likely catch something that will also be devastating for you. So people are really just trying to protect themselves. So for health workers, for instance, it's devastating. But you know, health workers, people who work in the burial teams, a lot of them have been made kind of homeless where you know so you know they have to find somewhere else their, their landlords kicking them out but family members also so you know in Sierra Leone there's a lot of extended family and people living together and you know if you then choose to become a burial you know to, to sign up to work as a burial team member for instance it's not unlikely that you know members of your household would say well find somewhere else to live because we think that you might be infected and you will infect all of us um, so that's really hard also in terms of trying to recruit people for the, for, the, for the intervention that's needed. And a lot needs to be done. You know, somebody needs to, whether it's a whole kind of uh, accommodation, um, a lot, lot needs to be done for actual health workers. The, um, we, we really have not looked, at, looked after them as they need to be looked after in this crisis. Survivors are finding it really hard just to make a livelihood. So um, I would say families, for instance, where um, if, if they were, so I know that a lot of families kind of say, I know, I'll give you an example of a mother, for instance, who was lucky um, not to get infected, but her two children did and survived, who had to move. So she literally moved town and went somewhere totally different where people didn't know her, where she could just start up. And that's, that's unusual in the sense that maybe that person had the resource to be able to do that. So a lot of other people will just be kind of living on the fringes. There will be a lot of work to pick up in Sierra Leone, you know, once the main crisis is over, because there will be a lot of homelessness, a lot of kind of serious destitution at a level that we had not known it before. People who are associated with Ebola is more so, like I said, like a fear thing. So whether you're a health worker or you're a survivor, Nobody's going to want to come close to you because they're going to automatically assume that you are you have a trace of the virus and and at any minute at any given time you can manifest symptoms and then you can infect the next person. So it's usually not a a, a positive thing. Like if you get healed, they'll say, "Oh, well, congratulations, but I feel like you still have a, a bit of trace in your blood of the virus." So I'm still going to, you know, stay clear of you just so that, you know, I don't take any chances or any risks. So that's usually how it is.